Welcome to Conversations for the Animals. I am Lisa Tynan with Houston Pet Set, and I'm excited to be joined not just today, but for the next couple of episodes by Laura Panino, who's the founder of Panino and Partners, which is a marketing and a PR firm. And we're we're doing, we're putting rather than just having conversations and podcasts, we're doing like a mini webinar series. Yeah. We're trying to, we're branching out and we're reaching out to our rescue community to really offer educational resources because we're all out here working day in and day out very, very hard. And we seem to be all butting up against some of the same problems. So over the course of the next few episodes, we're going to be addressing those problems kind of one by one to find reasonable, doable solutions, especially because so many of our partners are volunteers themselves. And in this animal welfare community, we're all on the same team. We're all working towards the same goal. And so we we want to provide these resources so that we can all work together towards that end goal of ending animal homelessness. So thank you for joining so me happy to be here. today and the next time and the next time. Um, I want to start, obviously, by learning a little bit about you, both professionally, because you are in this field of PR and marketing, but also personally, because you're also an animal rescuer. Oh, yeah. So we have the whole that you're you're in it and you're also outside of yeah. it looking from the outside. So tell us a little about yourself. Let me start from the beginning. Um, I am a Louisiana girl, um, born in New Orleans, grew up on a small farm just north of New Orleans. And I can tell you that I have loved animals um, my entire life. I grew up in a house where my family rescued everything. Awesome. I mean, it was like owls, turtles, <gasps> You know, broken down racehorses that nobody mm -hmm. wanted, uh, baby goats that were abandoned at the barn and things like that. So, you know, I watched my parents really um, caring for everything, you know, caring for humans who who, who needed rescue yes. sometimes yes. and animals, too. And um, I originally planned to be a veterinarian. So um, so the reason I didn't go that route was because I couldn't bear the thought of being in school longer forever <laughs> and not having any money while yeah. I was going to be in school. So I um, went to LSUJ school on scholarship. And so what I'm doing now is really blending that, um, blending that journalism and writing experience that transitioned into PR. I um, worked with the largest PR firm in the world, Edelman, which is, wow. you know, I worked there for nine years before I started my own firm. So I got great experience working on the big, big agency side. And now um, I'm really thankful to be able to work with clients of all size and anywhere in the world. Um, on the animal rescue side, what's been happening for me, um, it's hard to believe. I, I don't know why I started counting, but I did. And so in August of 2020, just as I was buying um, this amazing house in Galveston, uh, right about that time, animals were showing up, you know, mm. and, and I know the summer is, is a big time for cats and dogs and kittens and puppies, especially in our greater Houston area, yes. because it's so hot and the population allows for it, yes. unfortunately. I mean, the um, climate allows for it and the population is crazy. Mm -hmm. We have now all those problems. But anyway, these cats started showing up in August of 2020. And so like in August, all of a sudden I had like six cats. <laughs> And they were coming from all these different places and people knew, you know, it's like, look, if you have an animal, if you find an animal, call me first. I will see what I can do. A lot of times the animal's just lost. Don't automatically right. call animal control. Don't automatically take it to the shelter. So that's when that started happening. And since August of 2020, I have um, saved more than 50 animals uh, myself and I'm not a rescue just through fostering and adopting wow. and sometimes it's hearing a little cat crying outside at 5 30 in the morning and bringing it in and then the handyman adopts it you know right. so um, but I have worked with several different rescues and I met Tina and Tama with Houston Pet Set many many years ago mm -hmm. right at the very beginning so I'm honored to help you guys any way I can. Oh, we're so appreciative. And and that was a, a perfect segue into what we're going to be talking about today. Um, and anyone who is either professionally or volunteering within the animal welfare sphere or anyone who is friends with any of those people yeah. knows that we are facing a crisis of volunteering and mm -hmm. fostering. We are we have so many animals coming in and nowhere to send them for that temporary time, even before the adoption process. Right. There has to be some place for them to go. The shelters are full, 
volunteers are maxed out. Fosters can only have so many animals in their homes at the same time. And so what we're seeing is that our Houston Pets at our partners are desperate for volunteers and right. desperate for fosters. And we're all sort of scrambling for ideas mm -hmm. for how to recruit them, but then mm -hmm. how to retain them and how to keep them excited and involved and keep them from burning out. We know compassion fatigue is an issue right now. Um, so what we want to talk about today a little bit, not a little bit for the entirety of this, is what can groups do to keep those volunteers and those fosters active and engaged? How can they reach new groups, new people that they maybe haven't asked before um, and inspire people to be part of the solution mm -hmm. rather than feeling helpless and hopeless. Mm -hmm. So as a foster yourself and right. a volunteer, you know, what are you seeing? What are you seeing that are some of the positives that groups are doing mm -hmm. and what could groups be doing better? So one of the things um, I am actually a bona fide registered foster awesome. with two groups. Um, I'm officially registered with the Galveston Island Humane Society. A great partner of ours. Um, and yes. um, Houston Sheltie um, Sanctuary. Yes, you are a Sheltie fan, correct? Yeah, yes, yeah. okay. And who has suddenly gotten a pit mix too, so, <laughs> and, and lots of little stray cats yeah. um, that never thought they'd be mine, but, and I never thought they'd be mine, but anyway. <laughs> um, one thing I would say that I see that those groups do really well. I love that they have an official form. Okay. I love that. I love that they have, you know, sign up on your website or even in my case where I was going, going to be out of town and I called um, the Galveston Island Humane Society and I said, you know, I'm going to be out of town for a little bit. You know, I'm fostering Nala, but I have to go out of town and I have people on my team who are willing to foster. Mm -hmm. And they immediately said, get those two ladies to go online and register as fosters. Mm -hmm. So what was great is all that information was captured. Okay. And I really liked what they did about that. Okay. Um, in another case with the Houston Sheltie Sanctuary, I mean, I had adopted from several different Sheltie groups before, but I'd never fostered. Okay. I had adopted, but not fostered. And so there was a situation in um, Galveston where uh, a Sheltie showed up. You know, um, he was in the shelter and they were trying to pull him from the animal um, shelter, but they needed a foster. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, I can foster. And so the Houston Sheltie Sanctuary said, OK, could you sign up? Laura, we know you've adopted, but could you sign right. up as a foster? So I did that. It turned out that the lady who got him first ended up adopting okay. him. So that worked out great. But I liked the way they did that. Um, now. I would say those are very organized groups, right? Yes. And and a lot of your listeners are very organized as well. What I believe is an opportunity is it, it's also word of mouth, right? Mm -hmm. The rest of us who are fostering and adopting can be advocates yes. for fostering and adopting. So I would say to the extent that our rescue groups can really outline the roles of the fosters and make sure that the fosters know that in most cases, the medical needs and the the food, all that is right. covered, right? right? And I, I do believe some people are concerned about that. Right. So this is a, a, in some cases, a lack of communication. People are hesitant to foster because the groups aren't clear. Maybe about a lack what of understanding. Expect. Okay. Yeah. Maybe just. Um, and so one of the things that came to mind, Lisa, as I was preparing for, mm -hmm. you know, how are we going to go about this session today? To me, orientation mm -hmm. is a really great idea, and our group, our our rescue groups, could do mini orientation. Yes messages on on their websites, mm -hmm. on social media. This is what it's like to have different fosters and adopters do testimonials. I'd be happy to do a testimonial yeah. any day for anybody. But I believe, too, the downside, and we can come back to a deeper dive of, you know, what they can do. But on the downside, what I have observed, mm -hmm. and I'm not saying this is the case with everyone, it almost seems like there's a desperation mm -hmm. sometimes. And and with that desperation comes almost like a frenzy. Yes. And it can come across as not being organized or not being um, right minded. Sure. And it can it can come across a little crazy. And so what what I have said many times is I will be an emergency foster. And I think there's an opportunity. I think that's what you're talking yes. about, too, is 
who is the holding place? I like to be that holding place. Mm -hmm. I can say I can help you for 24 to 72 hours. Now, if that is said, and I am saying that, please honor that. Absolutely. And what I have found is, well, Laura, can you do seven days? Can you do 10 days? Oh, can't you keep the dog till January? No, that's not what I agreed to. Right. And then it's like, oh, oh, okay, well, that that that's not right. Mm -hmm. And then it comes back on me like I'm the bad guy. And right. it's like, no, I'm not. Right. So I would say if, if our fosters can, I mean, our rescue groups can really identify this emergency group like mm -hmm. me, mm -hmm. we could help more animals. Yes. Understanding that not everybody has the space or time to commit to a full, you know, one week, one month, six month foster. Right. And not, and this is true across the board, not making the people who are volunteering their time and their space feel guilty. Feel guilty. <laughs> it absolutely, that, that goes into the volunteer appreciation, which I know we, we plan to talk about a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Um, I think what you're getting at here, a lot of the times there is desperation because mm -hmm. we all, we all feel it. Every single one of us in this industry mm -hmm. feels this sense of panic that if I don't do something immediately, there, this animal suffers or this animal dies. And that is a mm -hmm. horrible weight that we are all bearing. But that's not necessarily a uh, pleasant environment to try and right. lure a newbie into. If you're trying to get a new foster, Mm -hmm. the desperation crisis isn't necessarily the right time to do it, right? Maybe mm -hmm. get them in the ahead of time ahead of time and mm -hmm. get them with their first experience being a healthy litter of three kittens. <laughs> not, not, not the crisis, because if you have that bad first experience, yeah. you've lost that person forever and you won't get them back. Yeah. And that's one more person that you could have had if you, if you, recruited them, oriented them properly in mm -hmm. the beginning, like mm -hmm. you said, and eased them in so that they understood what they were getting into. Absolutely. Yeah. Because if I, I, I know of several people who wanted to foster and that first foster experience was so negative that they never did it again. Yeah. And, and that is really unfortunate. I mean, the good news for me is with the mindset of a veterinarian. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, my mindset is I can't save them all. Absolutely. I, I will do my very best. I and and I recognize that every rescue group cannot save every of animal. Course. We do our best. Everybody does our best. And it seems to me that in this emergency mode, you know, it's like it, the way I look at it is it's like triage in the hospital. Mm -hmm. You know, we we get them maybe off the euthanasia list or we get them off the road where they've been injured. You right. know, I'll, sometimes I'll get these messages. Laura, can you go pick up the dog in Northwest Houston? It's out in the street. Well, my first response is get the dog off the street, you right. know, pick it up. You know, like, why are you, why are you well, sending me a message from Galveston? from Galveston? <laughs> yeah, like to go to Northwest Houston. So it seems like there's um, a need to be practical, but at the same time, you know, what I, what I feel is a great idea is to explain if there's this emergency foster situation, mm -hmm. What does that look like? Right. If you're a longer term foster, what does that look like? I've, I've fostered a set of cats, um, brothers. They were eight months old. I mean, eight. Yeah, I fostered them for eight months. They were very wow. large cats and they didn't show well. They did not like to be in the shelter. So it, it took a very special situation. Sure. We got them adopted, um, but they lived in my office for eight months. Yeah. And I was OK with that because they were sweet cats. Sure. I was I was fine with that and they didn't mess up anything. So I was all right <laughs> with that. But. But in the emergency situation, um, I helped um, pull a mom and her, her puppies mm -hmm. off of the euthanasia list at Bark. And, you know, that was like feeding three times. Well, the mom more than that, feeding yeah. her a lot with the puppy food. And the puppies, when that, by the time they moved on, they were like little chunks. I mean, they're beautiful. <laughs> but that's not easy for people to do. And the reason mm -hmm. that worked out for me was because it was over a holiday weekend yeah. and they were in my office and I, I, my office is downstairs from my house. So I could do that. Right. But once the staff started coming back, you can't have puppies crying in the background while right. you're trying to do business calls. Of course. So, yeah. yeah. And, and understanding that's, that's another great point. Knowing if I'm an organization that I have certain types of volunteers who are available for certain types of opportunities and not asking them to go outside of that. Like you mm -hmm. said, you have your version of fostering that works perfectly within your parameters, which is emergency being the way station between rescue mm -hmm. and a more permanent right. situation. Um, there are people who have 
<laughs> large dogs who can't foster cats. Take them off of your list yeah. if you are reaching out for cat fosters. Making sure you're not bombarding people and making mm -hmm. them feel like, I wish that I could do this, but I can't. I wish mm -hmm. that I could do this, but I can't. Because suddenly that feeling of guilt can nice. be really off-putting. If you say, well, I can't help the things that they need help with. People who travel a lot for work mm -hmm. are great foster candidates because they can't have their own pet necessarily, mm -hmm. but they can have temporary animals. But recognizing that's not the person you're going to ask for your long-term heartworm right. treatment, yeah. right? So being organized, it all comes back to this organization, right? Yeah. Being organized, having a list of your long-term fosters, your short-term mm -hmm. fosters, your large dog, small dog, the people who can drive out and pick yeah, up a dog exactly. off the street. So that yeah. that can be, and that's something you can do quietly in the evening one night when nothing else is happening and you can get your organization back on track with organization. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, the other thing that that I was thinking of is um, so many ways to help. Right. Mm -hmm. Like in 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 some cases, maybe it's it's collecting food. Right. Yes. Maybe it's it's having a food drive. Um, in another case, it might be showing up at a vaccine clinic. Mm -hmm. um, it can be in, in another case. There was I saw something on Facebook. Um, um, there's a dog that was found in Dickinson. He was in horrible, horrible shape. This little guy. I've never seen a dog in such bad shape. But um, there was a picture on Facebook. This dog's in Dickinson. We've identified a rescue. The rescue is in North Texas. We just need somebody who can go grab him today and get him to us. And I responded right away. It's like, I'm 20 minutes from Dickinson. Sure. I'm happy to go get him. So went and got him. And he was he had mange. He had the Demodex. Yeah. Demodex. He had that. And so it wasn't contagious, yeah. but we didn't know that until we took him to my vet the next day. So I isolated him. He was great all night. The little guy was covered with ticks, all that. Oh. But the very next morning, got him into my vet. The rescue group was amazing. They covered his bills. And then I drove to Crockett, Texas wow. that day, halfway. And then the lady's husband picked the dog up the other halfway. And so, you know, for me, it was a day out of my work, mm -hmm. but I own my own company and I have, you know, the option to do that. Sure. But it was but that was something that was less than 24 hours, less than 24 hours. And it seems like the communication was there. It was really good. There was a plan in place. Really good. And nobody was panicking. Nobody was panicking. <laughs> so we got it done. Exactly. And the animal benefited. So we you know, you were kind enough to provide a list of some of some mm -hmm. ways that organizations can maximize their volunteer usage mm -hmm. and can recruit people in who right. maybe, you know, we're we have a lot of people who volunteer for a multitude of organizations. They are like serial volunteers. Right. But those people get maxed out. Sure. They get burnt out. So how can we find this new batch? The new blood. Exactly. How can we bring them in? So, you know, one of the first thing you were talking about is prom just promoting the opportunities. Like yeah. tell people what they can do. Yeah. So how how are some ways that they can promote themselves, promote their opportunities and recruit people that maybe they haven't reached out to before. So what comes to mind for me, you know, we, we all go to places, yes. right? We all go to places and many of our, um, shops are dog friendly now mm -hmm. or pet friendly. A lot of the bars and restaurants have pet friendly patios. Right. So, I would say start at home mm -hmm. for all of us. We can start at home. In fact, I'm going to be writing an article Ooh. that's coming out um, later this summer on dog, dog, it's for dog days of summer and dog oh, yes. friendly places to go. Fabulous. You know, um, so what I would say is take what we know. Mm -hmm. Where are the vet clinics? Where are the grooming salons? Where mm -hmm. are the, the shops and the bars and the distilleries and all those places that all of us go to? Mm -hmm. Right. And, and tell them, hey, you know, would you mind if we put up some some flyers? Would yep. you mind if we had a little information table here one day? Yep. Would you mind if we did a volunteer drive or a volunteer orientation? I mean, that's one thing. Let's mm -hmm. go with what we already know. Yes. That's one option. Um, the other option uh, that I was thinking of, too, is what about incentivizing, mm -hmm. you know, our current volunteers to recruit more of their friends? Yes and family members and um, and explaining, you know, again, outlining these are all the different ways you can help. Yes. You know, almost like a checklist. It's five dollars goes to here and ten dollars goes to there, but all those different ways. And my thought is if there were an incentive, I mean, August is the clear of the shelters mm -hmm. month, right? Yep. So maybe if there's a lead up to a drive for volunteers 
between now and August. Yep. And almost like clear, clear the shelters, help us clear the shelters. Yes. We need your help in clearing the shelters. We need your help in getting the animals off the streets and in new homes. And so I think that's another part of the education. Yes. Um, but that's what I would say is like, what if we just had a really cool incentive program? Mm -hmm. And I don't know what that looks like. I don't know what the prize looks like. Right. I don't know what people care about most. You know, it could just be a $25 gift card, you know, for Look, if for, you're going to give me a $25 gift card anywhere, I will take it and I will be so happy about it. <laughs> the you know, economy. It, yeah. Yeah. Or it could be, um, you know, if we have relationships with doggy daycare, mm -hmm. you know, we've got volunteers that need to take their animals to daycare. Absolutely. You know, that would be really great, too. So I, I feel like we just need to start grassroots. Yes. And then to expand that out, I mean, Volunteer Houston, I know your rescue community goes mm -hmm. beyond Houston, but Volunteer Houston yes. always will help. Yes. And then another way we talked about is spreading the word via like next door mm -hmm. and Instagram and all the typical social media yes. channels. Um, but I have actually gone into my vet clinic and I said, hey, do you know about... Houston pet set, or do you know about second chance pets? Or mm -hmm. Do you know about this? And they're like, oh yeah, tell them we're happy to help. So just start the conversation. Just start the conversation. Absolutely. And one of the things that you had mentioned with incentivizing, you know, we don't know necessarily what people will like, but everybody likes recognition. Yeah. And and you and I had had a conversation previously about acknowledging mm -hmm. and thanking the people that are doing the work already and showing the people who aren't doing the work. This is how we feel about our volunteers. Literally just this morning, scrolling, you know, doing my morning Facebook scroll, three different groups, one of which wasn't even in animal welfare, had volunteer appreciation posts. And it made oh, my heart so happy that's really nice. because it, number one, it makes those volunteers feel mm -hmm. appreciated, which goes so far when you're mm -hmm. working behind the scenes, when you're the person who goes in and cleans the dog bowls, when oh, you're yeah. the person who's picking up the cat poo, right? <laughs> Sometimes <laughs> all the real stuff, all the real stuff. Sometimes all yeah. it takes is someone to say, thank you. I appreciate you. And I want everybody to know that. And then if I'm someone who hasn't volunteered, but I see that post, I see my friend tagged yeah. in that post. I say, well, wow, I want someone to post about that, about me. I want some, mm -hmm. but also... That group appreciates that hard work. That's a group I would like to dedicate my time to. Yeah. And one thing I'll share, um, and I'm not saying this to be boastful. I'm saying it because it's really cool mm -hmm. the way um, this editor made made the comment. Um, earlier this year, I was named one of the Houston's most influential women. Yes, it was, which is a yeah. well-deserved honor. Well, thank you. And Tina and Tama were there last the previous year. year yeah. yes. And so, um, but one of the things that the editor said to me, she said, Laura, it's not, it wasn't just because of your PR achievements. It's mm -hmm. because of everything you do for the animals. Yeah. And, and, and the neat thing about, and that was in, in the program. Yes. And it, that there were 350 people mm -hmm. at that event. And then more people saw that. So, so hopefully the message mm -hmm. got out too. And I, I put in there, I, I helped to foster or over 50 animals yes. since August. And so, you know, I believe the corporate arena mm -hmm. is great. Untapped. <laughs> great for us to spread the word. Yes. Because um, a lot of people do have pet-friendly workplaces Absolutely. like mine. Absolutely. Or they, they know that the people in their companies have animals. Even if they can't bring them into the office, they know that that's an important mm -hmm. part of their life. Mm -hmm. um, something else that we had mentioned that you briefly touched on with next door. You know, we talked about interacting with people in person, going to the breweries, the distilleries, the, our, our grooming salons. There is absolutely value in that face to face. But we all know in this digital age, it's hard. It's hard. And so mm -hmm. much of our recruitment and and our advertisement takes place online. Mm -hmm. And we have both experienced going to people's websites or going to people's pages and uh, going, yeah. where is the yeah. information that I need? Yeah. Where is yeah. literally yeah. anything that I, if I was interested in this organization and I looked at their website, there is a good chance I'd say, ooh. Exactly. <laughs> I know. I just got the chills. I don't I know. know what I know. I'm getting into. So what are what are some ways that groups can, and, and I will say, I'll preface this, I'm interrupting myself, you know, as a, a granting organization, when people apply to our grant program, we look at their website. That is not criteria for receiving a grant, but we are You're looking- just trying to validate. We're validating. We're making sure they are who they say they are and they're doing what they say they're doing. So we see a lot of websites and outside of the granting process, 
it, me as an animal lover and someone who wants to see these groups succeed, I look and I think, man, if they could just set aside a couple hundred dollars out of their budget to hire someone to fix this website, how far would that go? I mean, what are yeah. what are some of the the places they could just either spend a little time or a little money to boost their presence? Um, and I think there's even a, another component of that. It's like going back to how professional, I mean, yes. e even if it's just a one page site, mm -hmm. if it's if it's got all the information in there, it says call this person to do this, yes. to do that, um, to, you know, uh, the founders are just something very, very basic, but where it looks that it's easy to find out more information, yes. right? I would say if there's just that one page, mm -hmm. that's great, but make sure it's very clear who are the founders, when was it founded, what is the mission, how do people donate? How do yes. people get information? That's so important. But GoDaddy has <laughs> ways to build sites too yeah. for you know not very much money. Ours like is you were a saying. WordPress site. Yeah, you know, there are ways even if you're not a programmer right. of a designer of websites, you can still have a professional look. Yeah, site. and I'll give. Um, I won't say what the name of the group is, but um, there is a group that I found out about that is um, out of state, mm -hmm. and this group was tapped to pull some animals off of the euthanasia list mm -hmm. at Bark. Well, I found out that this group really does not have a foster network here. Okay. So my counsel to that group was, A, be careful about what you're agreeing to. Yes, we're sorry about the situation, you know, with any animal on mm -hmm. the euthanasia list. But if you're a rescue group in another state and you're small and you can't figure out how you're going to transport that's really important. Like, let's let's be realistic. I yes. think that's a really important thing is to be realistic about what they can and they can't do. Right. Secondly, with that same group, I was like, OK, Houston Pet Set might be able to help you. But when you call them, you better have your yes. information ready. Yes. Do not call these people. And she said, because she was I, I said, well, you need X, Y or Z. Oh, well, I don't know what it is. I said, you better find out. You, you cannot get on the phone with somebody who could potentially grant you money or grant you human resources mm -hmm. and you don't sound like you have it together. You don't have your your mm -hmm. your stuff together. Mm -hmm. So I think we've we've covered a lot of different ways that organizations can beef up their presence and reach out to people so that they can recruit and build their network. But it, it feels like the overall theme is be organized and be prepared and get communicate. out communicate and get out ahead of everything so that you are not in that constant state of fight or flight right. trying to save these animals last minute and and that's what's going to make you a more appealing mm -hmm. group for that new foster or that new volunteer. Yeah, and I would say uh, all that with an attitude of grace. Yes. Um and as hard as it can be to be gracious when you're tired or when you're stressed out, the more we can just remember, you know, if Thank you, volunteer, for that one thing you did. Yes. You know, thank you, officer of my organization, for starting this group. You yes. know, if we can just step back and remember that we can't do it all. I love the starfish story. You know, it's like yes. the guy was walking along the beach, right? Yep. And the starfish, he's throwing them back in and somebody says, hey, what are you doing? And it's not going to make a difference. And the guy says, well, it made a difference to that one. And so yep. if we can all remember that one, everyone matters. Yes. I feel like that's the right attitude. Absolutely. That's a perfect way to sum up this this first session and also a nice little preview into our next mm -hmm. session, which is talking about how we're presenting ourselves mm -hmm. as organizations, how we're interacting with people, basically our com the, the way that we interact with our community um, and coming from a place of grace and kindness and and gratitude. So a perfect sum up. Yeah. Um, if this was a helpful session to you that you've listened to, please join us for the next one. We are obviously focusing on animal welfare, but this is not exclusive. These ideas, these suggestions can apply to any nonprofit, right. any volunteer based organization. So right. tell your friends that we're having yeah. these conversations and we're going to be back with our next episode with Laura Panino from Panino and Partners. Thank you so much for joining Thank us you. for this first one, Conversations for the Animals, and we will see you next time. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.